Welcome back, guys. I've got a very special guest with me today. I've got the nomad capitalist himself, Mr. Andrew Henderson. He is well known for his line, go where you're treated best. I've been a follower for some time, and this is definitely uh, well within an area of knowledge that I want to learn more about. So I thought I'd come to you guys today with uh, Andrew, and we've got some big questions to ask as well, especially because of the cryptocurrency space that we're in. People want to structure themselves better initially so they're not slugged with a ton of tax. Uh, so that's why we're here with Andrew today, but I'll let him intro himself a little, a little bit of background, and then we'll get straight into those questions. Andrew, thanks again for being with me today. My pleasure. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. Anytime. So, yeah, you know, I've been talking about this stuff for, for many years, and uh, this has been a, a more than a dozen year journey to figure out where can I go where I'm treated best. That's what I uh, uh, call the five magic words, go where you're treated best. And uh, you're in Australia. I come from originally the United States. A lot of people watching are in Western countries, what I call legacy brand countries, uh, where they were once doing something pretty good. Maybe they were once not a bad place for tax. Maybe they were once not a bad place for innovation and the next big thing. But, you know, uh, it's kind of like the uh, Adam Carolla says it's like the hot blonde like in California. Uh, you know, uh, you don't keep up with it and eventually the legacy fades away. And so these countries are living off of fumes and uh, it's just not that appealing anymore. And so what I've been doing is traveling all over to over 100 countries. I have homes in multiple countries. I uh, have companies in different countries where, you know, specifically I am treated best, whether that's which company jurisdiction allows me to hire people from all over the world, uh, great talent, you know, which jurisdiction leaves me alone, which jurisdiction, if we're talking about Bitcoin and crypto, is going to leave me alone and let innovation take place and not try and get in the way and squash uh, whatever the next big thing is. And uh, I think it's important and um, happy to talk about it today. It's something that a lot of people I think are scared about, um, but we can talk about it. Definitely. No, it is a big one, especially obviously for my audience. Like I said, it's primarily cryptocurrency, which I'm, I'm into, but we also go into a little bit of investment and also property. You know, we do a lot into the property space as well with our, our cycles and other uh, education that we look at. Um, so yeah, looking at the countries which treat us the best is obviously your forte. And there is a ton of content on your channels. I've watched that for a long time. So I'll leave the links to all of your stuff down below in the description so people can find you. Um, but speaking of the best countries, that's your, your specialty. I want to open the question up to which would be the worst countries because we are in, uh, you know, a lot of people watching here are in Western developed countries. So which would be the worst countries out of the Western countries to live in for stuff like personal tax, freedoms, business opportunities, which ones are worse for say like the crypto friendliness and of course, capital gains tax. And then we'll, we've got a couple of other questions to brighten the mood after that. But first up, the worst countries out of these Western developed countries and why? Well, if you're in a developed country, you probably you know think, oh, it's Zimbabwe or Iran or China or something. Okay, maybe these are a problem. You know, here's what I've tried to shine a light on is when we publish the Nomad Passport Index in every, every year. Uh, we rank the world's best passports based on not just travel, but based on a number of factors, tax, obligations as a citizen, even if you live overseas, um, which is a big issue for Americans. And the US passport doesn't even crack the top 40 anymore. So does that make it the worst? No, um, certainly there are far worse, but it makes it far worse than you thought it was. And so I don't know if the Western countries are the worst, certainly they're not the worst, but, uh, you know, I look at Australia right now, where not only can you not leave, and if you try and go through New Zealand, then you get in trouble, and if you try and do this, then you, but if you've already left and you want to come back, because theoretically they want everyone to not leave, right? They want all the Australians under one roof. Uh, you can't come back without fines, without uh, all kinds of stuff. And of course, there's so many excuses. I run a business. I've been in business my entire adult life. And uh, of course, you're going to have people who work for you. You're going to have vendors who are always going to have, you know, a, a good reason, quote unquote. They have a good reason. Oh, we have this. We have that. It's the pandemic. Really? You're a citizen of a country. You can't even come back to it. By the way, meanwhile, you may have not been able to qualify for all the things you needed to do to extricate yourself from the Australian tax system. So perhaps you're still paying their top, you know, high 40 percent rates while you're not even allowed to come into the country. And it kind of turns the entire concept of citizenship on its ear. So that has to be one of the worst. I would say New Zealand, 
while some of their numbers have looked good and while they've certainly been somewhat more tax favorable, he's drifting in the wrong direction. It's easy to pick on the United States um, and they've done a lot of dumb stuff. Um, I think that they are, what makes the US problematic is they're very unreliable right now. And even 10 years ago, you saw guys like Steve Wynn saying that it's the Chinese government is much more reliable and much more easy to, to deal with than the US government because things are always changing. So if I'm in a, in a, in a new space, that's going to be one of the worst for me because I want some level of certainty. So any kind of big country, any kind of legacy brand country, in my mind, is a problem. Are there some that are better than others? Sure. But, it, you know, even some of the ones that I liked out of those English speaking countries, I've been a big fan of Ireland for a long time. I think that they've probably done some things in the last year or two that have been silly as well. So um, there is definitely a trend. The culture in the Western world uh, is moving towards less freedom higher tax. By the way, in the US, it's bad if you're successful. They want to basically put all kinds of new taxes on the top 0.3%. Well, if you were buying Bitcoin at $5, as people I've been working with recently, if you uh, started a business and you did well selling something online, um, it wouldn't be that difficult to make it into the top 0.3%. It sounds great, but that's what it's all about in the Western world, what sounds great right now. It's not about um, you know what that actually is. So you made a million bucks. Okay, congratulations. Very successful. It's a lot of money. It's hardly unique anymore. Millions of people, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, <laughs> they're making a million bucks. So I just think that that's the problem with these countries in general. It's hard to pick one that's, that's worse than the other because they're all kind of playing from the same playbook. So I, I know you've spoken before about New Zealand. New Zealand's, you looked at that place as, as somewhere to go rather than say Australia or uh, US or UK, is that still slipping into, you know, that sort of space as being one of the worst? Well, I said even four and a half years ago, I thought New Zealand was a bit overrated. And I've been talking ever since then about, hey, here are places that I think could be better than New Zealand for someone who's a high net worth or ultra high net worth individual. You've had guys like Peter Thiel going down there, and I suppose it works for them. It is certainly a um, you know, middle of nowhere, kind of apocalypse bug out place in addition to having some levels of tax friendliness. Number one, uh, that they were talking recently about they're beefing up um, tax enforcement in New Zealand. And um, coming from the US, the numbers they're talking about, it's kind of funny just, you know, how little it is to beef up tax enforcement. But the idea is same thing in the US, these greedy rich, basically, they think everyone who is rich is a cheat. Uh, and so then they want to treat you as such. You must be cheating in your taxes. You must be doing that. I, I don't know anyone cheating on their taxes. I've never known anyone like that. But um, and then they're saying, well, maybe we want to have an inheritance tax. You know, maybe we want to have a wealth tax. I mean, so there are a lot of proposals going around. And, you know, is that going to happen in New Zealand quite as quickly? No. But what I do notice is the same thing when people want to go overseas. Uh, sometimes they'll say, Andrew, you're crazy. I'm from the US and I tried to move to the UK and Australia and both are also terrible. So your entire thing, it, it just doesn't work. <laughs> and they're going, they, it's the same reason that people go to these same very similar countries and then wonder why it doesn't work is these similar countries get ideas from each other. They are the closest economic partners, the, the five eyes, they have all the, you know, they get together at all these different meetings and they share their latest bad ideas. Um, they're on the same page. So yeah, I think New Zealand you know, has had some benefits. Um, I thought they were kind of overblown. I think anytime someone gets a lot of publicity, you want to be careful. But I, I think that they will all trend in the wrong direction. The trend is not your friend, whether one is a little bit faster than the other or one's ahead of the other, uh, to me is somewhat irrelevant. You know, it's not about let's go, no place is perfect, but it's not about let's go from the frying pan to another frying pan. Yeah, in that case, we got the frying pans. I was thinking of structuring the question a different way. If you had to choose out of these countries, which one would you go to? The UK, US, mm. Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Singapore. You know, these Western developed oh. countries, which are English speaking. You can only choose yeah. out of these. Well, Singapore, I mean, no doubt. Now, uh, I mean, what we've seen in Asia the last year and a half is Asia is a little bit of the benevolent king model. When people ask, you know, why is Asia more closed than the rest of the world right now? I mean, it's not a surprise to me. That's how they operate. Um, it is that benevolent king sort of model. Now, as you know, I have a home in Malaysia that is relatively English speaking. And so I would choose to go there because I like a bit more of the grit. It's a bit more open. There's more to do. 
Um, I had a great time there last year uh, when other when a lot of the other people were in lockdown. We were we were back to normal for a while. Um, now I would choose Singapore next door. If I had to sure. choose one of the one of the you know Western kind of traditional um, developed countries, I suppose the UK for someone who's not from the UK would still offer the best tax benefits and it's the best quality of life. Um, so there's a couple of different elements that go into it. Uh, I am not a total doom and gloom person when it comes to personal freedom. I do see it going in the wrong direction. I do think if you go to a Belgrade, Serbia, or a Tbilisi, Georgia, or a Medellin, Colombia, that you can just have a greater soft feeling of freedom than you'll feel in the West. People just leave you alone generally. Um, but you know, I think that you could deal with it in everyday life. It's funny how people complain that other countries don't have freedom. They live in New York City. They live in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. There's rules I mean, about how you water your lawn. Come on. Uh, but I think from a tax perspective- Sounds like Australia. <laughs> no, when you're seven or eight figure or nine figure, I mean, the financials matter. And it's all, the financials matter partially from an emotional point of view. How do you feel about giving $20 million away in your lifetime? Not good. Um, I would probably choose the UK above Singapore, but then I Singapore- are you talking about the territories of, of the UK? I know you've spoken of, say, like Jersey or Gibraltar. I'm talking about the UK. And if you set up your affairs properly, you could be relatively tax friendly. But sure, I mean, would I personally want to live in Jersey? No, but Jersey could work. We have somebody going to Gibraltar right now. Mm -hmm. um, Sark has become incredibly popular. I mean, the population has gone up by like 20% uh, to what is it, a thousand people or something. So, but no, I, I think the UK, um, living in the mainland UK could also work. Um, but you know, right. Singapore's on the table. I'm taking, I'm taking that. Taking Singapore. I think there's oh. weather. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I, I could personally, I wouldn't want to go to the UK either. Weather sucks. Gibraltar's nice. I mean, I've been there. I could do that. But looking at the worst countries, that's what you would choose. So the next thing I had was where could these people move to? And I was looking primarily at the Western developed stuff because yeah. You know, I've, I've mentioned it a few times. I've spoken with guys who you've spoken to, uh, say crypto tips, you know, Heidi and Toby, yeah. they moved to Portugal. So I've brought that up. I've brought them on the channel before and people just seem kind of reluctant to want to move to somewhere that they're, um, you know, they're not familiar with just like what you're talking about. You know, there's heaps of these options in Eastern Europe or South America, but it's kind of like, I need to go somewhere familiar first. So that's why I brought those up. Then it was like, you know, where could these people move to? So US, is it easy to go from the US to the UK or you got to do a few steps in between? Yeah, I think if you can't go from the US to the UK, now people say, oh, it's the same thing. And it's not the same thing. It's a different culture. It's a different way of operating. It's less direct. The language is a little bit different. But, you know, by and large, it's kind of the same thing where people in the US get so fed up with the Mexicans who are all coming in, you know, compared to the rest of the world and who other countries' neighbors are, if you can't get along with the Mexicans, the same general culture, family-friendly, similar religion to a lot of the people complaining, I mean, you know, they are pretty darn similar. And so if I'm an American and I want a lot of that culture, like I want good service, I want warmth, I want, I'm looking at Mexico. And the only barrier is the language because it really is very similar. A lot of the same brands, I mean, down to, you want to go to the Circle K and get your hot dog. Uh, they have that. They're not going to have that in the UK. So in a sense, Mexico, other than the language, and even that in some cases, in some bubbles, you can, you can get by, then the language uh, is the really the one barrier. The UK and all those other countries, but as we've said, I mean, you can't go from one place to a very similar place and expect huge results, right? You got to kind of shake things up. So Portugal is maybe a nice soft landing among the, the caliber of Mexico. It is going to be different. If you're coming from the US or Australia, it is still Europe. It still has some of those European things that maybe we don't understand. You know, why is some stuff closed on Sunday or why isn't it 24 hours or that kind of thing. But uh, I think Portugal is a good one. The landscape is similar. But think about it. You know, what is the difference between someone who lives in Portugal and someone who lives in Georgia or someone who lives in Uruguay um, or someone who lives in Panama or someone who lives in Thailand? Um, certainly there are degrees of this, but uh, you probably get a lot more of the consumer conveniences living in a place like a Thailand, uh, living in a place like a Malaysia. And so, you know, the question is what's important. I think that a period of exploration is important where you maybe you put six places on the hit list and you go check them out while having one base that you think is the number one. You change the base if you don't like it, but Portugal works. Um, you've got countries like Uruguay and Chile with exemptions. You've got what are called territorial tax countries where you could structure your crypto and businesses properly. A lot of those in Central America, Costa Rica just decided it's, it's 
probably going to stay on that list. Um, Georgia and Eastern Europe. Um, you've also got countries where if you want to live nomadically, what I've said is have a trifecta approach where not only for tax reasons, but but you know, originally for me, it was just because I wanted to have different experiences. You have the warmth of the Mexican culture. Maybe then you go somewhere in Europe. Maybe then you go somewhere in Asia, four months a year. And so you could potentially structure it that way. So Portugal is a great kind of one-stop shop. Um, obviously, there are also tax-free countries, some of the Caribbean islands where you can get citizenship, um, you know, the UAE. Um, you've got countries that are offering exemptions on crypto, like a, like a Belarus. So, you know, there's lots of places to go. I would say, what are the factors? Mm -hmm. You know, if you're single, you have a different list of priorities than if you're married. On from that, what would be a good solution for people who wanted to stay in their countries? Say, like... US or UK, Australia, are there any good solutions if you wanted to stay in your country? Well, you mentioned if you're in the, if you're in the UK, um, you know, maybe you look at one of the, the nearby territories, um, which is technically not, I guess, staying in your country. If you're in the US, look at moving to Puerto Rico. Um, a lot of people who ex eventually want to leave the US for good, go to Puerto Rico first. Um, if you want to stay in your country, for me, it's all about being prepared and being diversified. So you mentioned property, have some property somewhere else. Um, one of the best off the wall citizenship programs right now that I think offers a great value is Turkey's citizenship by investment. I think that also happens to be an investable market if you do it properly and you don't buy into all the hype of all the guys hawking their wares at the airport and you work with professionals. Um, so I think that could be a good real estate market, even as the layer is dropping. I'm aware the layer is dropping. I know you've um, spoken about that on the channel as well. So people are concerned that usually comments will come up about that. Well, the Turkish layer is down like 70, 80, 90%. But there is a lot of videos on, a lot, yeah, a lot of videos yeah, on the channel so talking about how buy, to do that. Yeah, here's the thing: the the Iranian um, real is down, you know, ninety nine percent or whatever it may be. Um, pro Venezuela, I mean, look at that property still has value if you bought it correctly. Um, people who are wealthy are not selling prime properties for nothing. Um, so I think that there are some opportunities there. Now, if you just want to invest in property, there's some fix and flip opportunities that maybe minimize the currency risk in terms of the short term. I think it's a three-year hold, not a bad citizenship to, uh, to get because it's different than what most Westerners have. Um, so I would be diversifying. I'd have real estate in other countries. It doesn't have to be to get citizenship. I'd be looking at other countries um, next door in Georgia, one of the easiest places to own real estate, lowest cost, Correct. Really, no taxes, nothing to file. Everything can be done digitally, automatically. Um, other countries around the world, maybe you could get a permanent residence or whatever. So I'd be diversifying. And if I could get an immigration kicker out of that, I would. I'd have any fiat. If I have a fiat account, I would look at having one of those overseas. I may have to report that to the tax authority. Um, In your home that. jurisdiction? Yes. Right. Yeah. So if I'm living, if I'm, a, if I'm an American, I'm going to file an FBAR, for example, for my uh, foreign accounts. If I have some precious metals, I'm going to vault it somewhere else. So I'm going to have a second passport or a second residence. So I've got a place to go. I'm basically going to have the whole bag of tricks ready. Um, you know, as there's an old uh, Chinese uh, story about a uh, uh, fast boat and, and a second set of papers in the harbor. You're ready to go when problems happen. And I think inevitably they will. Uh, you're ready to, to go. And uh, I think what I hear far too much is people coming and saying, holy cow, I think there's going to pass a new capital gains tax in 45 days. What do I do? I need a second passport. Well, as you're mentioning, even if you got a second passport, you're not going to be fully ready to implement this plan because we're human beings. You're not going to just burn down your house and take everything with you in 45 days. I mean, so you want to start preparing now for something that might happen a year or two or three years from now by, by already having stuff in other countries. And everything we're talking about here is essentially set up under a company sort of structure. Yeah, LLC type, or for us here, it's a PTY LTD type of structure. It's not, we're not really referring to income tax here. You know, if you're getting, if you're getting taxed in the, your jurisdiction, in the country you live in, that's a different story. The way you're structuring yourself outside of the country has to be in other businesses or structures. Well, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. If you live in Australia, you're not going to have a lot of access to offshore structures that are going to really help you from a tax perspective. I mean, they've figured out and people will come and say, hey, why don't I just put all my assets in this British Virgin Islands company and then go back to living in Canada? Well, they figure that one out, right? But um, if you want to use those kind of structures for asset protection, sure, that can be a valuable thing to do. Um, if you want to 
just move assets even in your own name sometimes makes sense. Sometimes owning property in your own name in countries where there isn't the kind of liability risk you might find, let's say the US, that's gonna work better from a tax perspective. That's what the country is built around. So by the way, uh, if you are again an American and you own property in your own name, now not if you derive income from it, but if you just own the property, that is not a reportable asset. Precious metals, privately vaulted, not reportable assets. So um, that is something that you can do to get some privacy get some assets out. And then if you ever wanted to go to Singapore and pick up your gold bars, uh, you could do that. I think really, if I'm in the crypto space, what I've said for years, have a second citizenship. If you are you know, in the seven figure range, I would start to look at a Caribbean citizenship by investment. If you're in the eight figure range and above, uh, maybe I would look at Malta's uh, program in Europe if you think that smaller countries in the EU will be okay. Uh, if you are not in any of those ranges, then I'd be looking at some kind of residence program where I can just spend minimal amounts of time every year and work towards a citizenship by making a small investment. But I think you're going to need that because there may come a time when you just want to leave. They may not want you to leave. You may not be able to get your passport. Um, or just quite frankly, they're going to say, hey, starting next month, all the Australians have to pay a huge tax. And you might say, I don't need this. Yeah, then you're stuck. So like you said, better to structure yourself now. Market is down. It's a bit quiet now. So these are the times to be getting rolling on with that. Uh, lastly, I wanted to go and ask, uh, you know, which is the best Western country in the world to live in for cryptocurrency investors? So cryptocurrency specific, we've kind oh. of touched on it a few times here. You know, costs and things like that, if you can mention it. Yeah, well, again, I think Portugal is kind of the go-to one. Um, I think that definitely looking at some of the Caribbean islands uh, is worthwhile. Like, um, again, like an Antigua, uh, like a St. Kitts. Um, again, and I mentioned Georgia, not so Western. Uh, listen, you have a couple exemptions in places like Germany um, that have some, some deals for long-term. My concern on a country like that is it's not gonna last. Mm. So Portugal is perhaps the de facto of the Western countries. But I think there's so many other places that you should look at that offer decent quality of life. By the way, it also, de also depends on what your citizenship is. Do you qualify for certain tax incentives in a country like Italy? Um, you know, that could work. So you're going to pay something. Listen, if it's about lifestyle, you know, it may be worth, if you're going to Europe, paying a little bit of something. Um, when I have active business owners come and they're going to go to Europe, they're never going to pay zero the way they would in Dubai or Panama or somewhere else. But they can pay a little bit of something. And maybe that's worth it, right? Maybe it's just worth, that's the price of admission. Europe is more complicated. It's more expensive. And, and in some cases, there may be more tax. But, um, you know, Portugal is a good one. I will say on your earlier comment, um, you know, definitely, uh, people do wait until it's too long. And I think that right now with the chips being down a little bit, the idea is, you know, I know it's like to run a business and have a bad month. You don't feel good, but that's the time when you want to rebuild. That's the time when you want to figure out, all right, how do we improve the website conversion rate or something? And I think the same thing is true with crypto. If you were to move yourself out of Australia right now, you're going to have a much lower number to contend with when you do when everyone's excited and you have to mark it up that means if you have an exit tax to leave your country it's going to be higher i've got people right now who are calling who are americans saying i've got a million dollars and it's going to hurt for me to buy a second passport but i want that ability if i want to leave the us before i hit the two million dollar mark and i've when i become what's called a covered expatriate and i have to pay an exit tax to leave so i don't i'm not going to call you when i have 1.95 million i realize the chips are down it's going to be painful to take out this decent chunk of my net worth to get this done. But, um, you know, now's the time. So I would look at this as opportunity rather than than misery. I mean, that's the way we always should look at it when we're investing. Markets down, buy low, sell high, pretty straightforward. But human nature, <laughs> we usually leave it to the last minutes. But I just hope for the guys who are watching, yeah, I hope for the guys that are watching, if they are looking to leapfrog into those next brackets, during this next stage of a bull market, whenever that may be, that they're prepared for it and they've got some structure, which is why you know I brought you on, and they can come and, to and, get and, more and, of your comment. It's the same thing with business. I have guy. I had a guy. Uh, hey, I've got a thirty million dollar business. I said, okay, it's going to cost you some money. Here's what I would do. Let's get started on this. He calls me back two years later. Okay, now I've got a sixty million dollar business, and and then like another year later, okay, now it's eighty and I'm selling it. Like I've got a contract signed. I think we managed to find a couple hundred thousand dollars in savings. So that's a good ROI, but it's like, you know, between 30 and $80 million, you've got, you know, potentially was it $18 million in savings or something like you could have achieved. So a couple hundred grand versus $18 million. 
you can't wait until the last minute. I mean, you can't move to Puerto Rico the day before you sell your crypto as an American and say, oh, well, this none of this counts. No, you have to move and lock it in, right? So if the numbers are down and you think this is when it's down, then, then lock some stuff in, take some action. And again, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, it doesn't take you know two days to get a second passport. So that, that's my general advice from experience. And I'll, I'll, I'll finish on for the guys who don't have 20 60, $80 million businesses, or even net worths of one or 2 million in crypto, what they're probably asking, well, what price should I start to look at this? You know, what's sort of the lowest mark that you would start to consider looking to move in order to reduce your, your tax? How much net worth should well, you here's have? The other thing. Let's say I'm in Australia and I can move to Thailand. I don't know how many thousands of dollars you're going to save a month in cost of living, but I've got a guy right now where he's specifically looking to move out of Australia because he wants to reduce the cost of living and because he can put more money into crypto, right? So if you were to move to a Thailand, I mean, I don't know, could you save two or $3,000 a month? And that, that's worth going and getting a Thai elite visa, for example. Again, it's going to sting you up front. Or maybe you just live a nomadic life or, you know, Mexico, um, any of these countries with kind of cheap residence permit options. Or, you know, it's, it's difficult right now, but you could just be theoretically nomadic. Now, depending on which country you're from, you're going to have to maybe set up a house somewhere, set up a tax home. There's a lot of different factors that go into this, but I, I think it's worth it for anybody because, um, yes, when you start investing in Caribbean citizenship by investment, that's a seven-figure thing. I would generally put the, put the bar down as low as a million dollars for someone in crypto, or as I might put it as a couple million dollars for someone in business. Um, but there's not a lot of expense in getting a residence permit in you know, an emerging country and just going there, taking advantage of uh, the benefits and uh, pocketing some more money. So I think it's one of those cases where you pay some money up front and then you get it back pretty quickly, even if it's just cost of living. All right. So pretty much like you said, it's for... And, and here's what I would also argue. There's an emotional aspect. Maybe you're not surrounded by people who agree with you. We just had a sold out conference a couple months ago uh, called Nomad Capitalist Live. Do you know how people came? They you had they Robert Kiyosaki the there? We had Robert Kiyosaki. We had the former president of Georgia and others, but, and a lot of our team, but what they liked was 350 people sold out room of people who are like me. And I think there's a mindset shift. If you don't have that where you're living, switch to somewhere else. It's going to be a much more conscious effort in, let's say, a Portugal, right? Where you've got people who are doing crypto in a Thailand, in other places where people are going. And you can create that life that you want that maybe is harder, whether in reality or psychologically, where you're living, that's going to motivate you. That's what we all need is that motivation. So I think that not only do people save money on tax, they save money on the cost of living, but they find themselves becoming more successful um, because they're more in alignment. And it's a little bit woo woo, but I've seen it in my own life. When I left the US for good and cut all my ties, cut the final ties, business exploded. There's something about that the authenticity of that, that I think helps people. It's basically shifting yourself, shifting yourself physically because you need to make that big change. Like you're saying about if you want big results, you got to make big changes. So no, I've, I've felt that as well. I left Australia for a little while, I think a year, year and a half. Uh, and then I do it regularly and you sort of feel that, that shift and that movement again. So I guess if there are those guys, their twenties, thirties, maybe they're not tied to anything here, then at least start to look into those developing countries to get yourself away from it in order to save. It doesn't cost you too much upfront. And then you can start to invest that into crypto. And then you're not tied, unfortunately, not the Americans, but you're not tied to your home country's tax, uh, you know, their, their tax rates and things like that. You can sort of start to set yourself up in that regard. Now's a good time, I guess. Market is down. Yeah. It's always a good time. You know, if you believe in yourself, um, that's one thing I had to learn over the years in terms of business. Um, if you have skills, if you're good at trading, if you're good at, you know, investing, if you've picked up on something that's good, that's not going to change overnight. You know, the fundamentals, even when the chips are down a little bit, you have to have some confidence in yourself. Um, again, it was a lesson that I really had to put a lot of effort into in not thinking that things were always falling apart. But, you know, if you're confident in what you're doing, this is how guys create unicorns. This is how guys create great businesses is, yeah, of course, there's a lot of struggles. They just keep plowing on. And for me, the thing in crypto is certainty or a greater level of certainty, you know, tax minimization, lifestyle optimization, you know, freeing up as much cash as possible. 
Um, these are all things that you can accomplish. And so I think it's always a good time, but now is an especially good time. Awesome. On that note, thanks very much. I reckon that's a My great pleasure. place to end. Uh, hopefully we can have you on the channel again in the future. And yeah, guys, if you want to see Andrew again on the channel, you got other questions, we've missed something that you wanted to know about, let me know in the comments down below, drop those down there. Um, see if we can get Andrew on in the future. Thank you very much for your time. And, uh, you know, have a, have a great day wherever you are in the world. Where are you at the moment? Uh, Montenegro. Montenegro. Beautiful. Another good spot. All right. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll get you to stay on the line, but I'll say goodbye to everyone else. Thanks for joining. Um, remember to jump across to Andrew's channel, The Nomad Capitalist. All the links will be down below. If you want to learn more about tax minimization, second citizenships, and everything else that goes in between to obviously keep as much as you can. We can make money, but we've got to keep as much as we possibly can. Cheers once again. I've said that about three times. So, all right, guys, have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>